Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Behind the glitter of Korea's economic success story lies a land of fault lines and social strife. Regionalism and factionalism are defining aspects of Korea's politics and social fabric, while the rights of workers and minorities are sacrificed in the name of economic efficiency and social conformity. The media cannot report freely, foreign journalists and scholars are under pressure to spin a positive image of Korea abroad, and Koreans themselves live in fear of repression should they express ideas their government does not share. This rather grim portrayal of South Korea is what you may be tempted to take away from koreaexpose.com. According to its founder and editor-in-chief, Dr. Se Wung Koo, Korea Exposé is dedicated to covering topics that do not receive enough attention from both South Korean and foreign media. As he argues, reporting about poverty, discrimination, and disenfranchisement is incompatible with the image South Korea wants to broadcast to the world. We talked to Dr. Koo about his plans for Korea Exposé, the media's failure to cover difficult and often controversial topics, and some of the injustices Korea suffers from. After receiving his PhD in Religious Studies from Stanford University, Dr. Koo was a Korea Foundation postdoctoral fellow at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris and taught Korean studies at Stanford, Yale, and Iwa Women's University. His writings have been featured in numerous publications, including Foreign Policy and The New York Times. Dr. Koo, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit about your uh, academic background and why you decided to come back to Korea, your birth country. My PhD was um, in religious studies, but I actually wrote my dissertation on the relationship between national identity and religion in Korea since the modern period. So as a specialist on Korea, this is certainly the country that interests me a lot. And I've always wanted to write more about it in a way that is engaging to people. Uh, When you write academic articles or do research, um, none of these things really resonate with the public because it's too opaque. People can read it if they want to, but it's not really something they want to. It's not interesting. So I uh, wrote something last summer on Korean education for the New York Times. And for surprisingly, it received an incredible response. That's when I really realized there are actually readers out there who want to know more about Korea and they don't really feel satisfied with what they see in the traditional media. So I wanted to do more work with that, but unfortunately, if I were to write for existing outlets, it just takes time. And also there's uh, the editorial process and I need to abide by what they want me to write and say. So I decided to take control and create my own platform. And, and I now actually do have friends who have been helping me because they felt exactly the same way. And so your platform is called Korea Exposé. That's the name we came up with. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the tagline is showing Korea as it really is. So you seem to position yourself in, in opposition to the mainstream depiction of Korea. Mm-hmm. What is that mainstream depiction? And why do you think that image of Korea needs to be, well, corrected or exposed? We were conscious of two different types of representation. One is the representation produced by the Korean government. That's the official Korea that I think Korean bureaucrats would like us, by which I mean foreigners, to see. And then there is the kind of representation representation produced by foreign media too, which I felt was extremely limited. The case that really illustrates the deficiencies or the failure of the foreign media in covering Korea is how recently... During the height of the Nutgate scandal, everybody was so busy writing about Choyana and what exactly she did on that plane in JFK. But in reality, the biggest news in Korea was not that, at least not the most important news. The most important news was this um, the leak in the Blue House of documents that alleged that a former chief of staff to the president, when she was a member of the National Assembly, was covertly trying to influence politics by colluding with other officials in the Blue House. And that these uh, leaked documents were allegedly produced for the consumption of the president's brother. And that there were people who were interested in ousting the current chief of staff, um, Kim Ki-chun, who used to serve Park Geun-hye's father during the Yushin era. And that was really what I think the media should have paid attention to. But I know this kind of news doesn't generate clicks. And, uh, and 
Notgate became what Korea became known for in December 2014, January 2015. And this is all too common, in my point of view. Do, do you blame the journalists, or isn't it just a fact of life that it's too complicated for a foreign audience to get what's going on in the Blue House, whereas in Notgate, everybody gets that? It is complicated. It doesn't mean we shouldn't write about it. However, I think it's a difficult story for anyone who doesn't know Korea to really write about, especially write well about, and also for editors who know nothing about Korea. It's not something that's going to catch their attention. And the editors at foreign outlets, they also recognize what readers want. And what readers want is the nutgate. They don't want Byzantine power struggle in the presidential office of a faraway country. That's the reality of the foreign media. And I think that's also the space where websites like Korea Expose can really operate. I think to know Korea as it really is, if I may sound pretentious, uh, you do need to know the language. I think you do need to live here and you do need to know Koreans, not just as friends, but as colleagues, perhaps even as family. And these are the things I have been fortunate enough to see because I was born here and I grew up here and I still have family ties here and I have worked in Korea. So I thought perhaps I can say something different mm. that I thought was authentic. So you state that your ambition is to go beyond these cliches and the superficial analysis. Mm -hmm. I think the first question is, is, is where do you see that superficial analysis? You mentioned international media. What about mm. the Korean media itself? You know, Just to answer it in one word, everywhere. <laughs> When you read the foreign media, what do you see? Well, I think at the beginning, uh, much of what we read about Korea had to do with not South Korea, but it's about North Korea. Every time North Korea launches a missile, there's going to be an article in all the wire services, in the main newspapers. But where is South Korea in all this? Because when I say Korea, I often mean South Korea. North Korea is not my expertise, and I certainly don't write about it because I truly believe I am ignorant. But that's what you see. And then later, I think what we found was uh, technology-related news. Samsung started doing well, LG, these companies, uh, and then the economy. And I think now we're sort of in a phase where we see um, a lot more about K-pop. And by extension, Korea being weird. Look at Koreans having plastic surgery. Aren't they obsessed? I think there was uh, something on Facebook the other day showing a segment from a Korean morning drama where uh, this uh, middle-aged woman was slapping a man with kimchi, right? I think that went viral. <laughs> so, yes, it's funny. But when you take things out of context like that, a lot of things are amusing. But is that the real Korea? I would like to say no. And why is Korea a victim, so to speak, of this kind of coverage? I mean, is it because the media is lazy? Or who has an interest in maintaining this... this mainstream image of Korea as we see it. I don't think there is an evil overlord who is uh, saying about Korea we will only write this. But I think one thing these things have in common is perhaps something exotic. I do definitely think we're seeing a certain manifestation of Orientalism even with North Korea. I mean, Why do we care about North Korea? Well, it's an evil dictatorship. Right? Let's see what other strange things they do. Even Samsung and LG to some extent, I think there's this fascination that these companies kind of came out of nowhere. And then naturally we go to K-pop, which, well, I don't know if that's your cup of tea, but, but for me, it's so artificial. It's manufactured. People can see that. But precisely because it's so engineered, I think that may be part of its appeal. You mentioned Orientalism. Isn't there also self-Orientalism? Because the Korean media and the Korean government also feed, you know, a certain image to the West. Mm -hmm. um, that also plays a role, doesn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. I think, um, especially the way K-pop is being promoted so heavily by the government as the one of the main industries for Korea in the 21st century. I think that's actually quite damaging rather than productive, because once again, it only goes to reinforce this uh, stereotype. Korea can produce a lot of shiny, slightly weird things. But where is something more profound, authentic? I like that word, so I keep using it. And then being in Korea, I think there is a lot of authentic things. Um, there is a lot of interesting things, things going on in Korea today. And, and that was partly what we wanted to cover in Korea Expose. 
Although, you know, sometimes it does come across as very weird after we write about it. Reading your articles, it seems that there's some form of anger or maybe a passion about <laughs> South Korea. But what makes you so angry? Why, why are you so passionate? Uh, I do write of anger. That's true. Because um, aside from the weird things, what really gets me going about Korea is the fact that there are so many things that are simply um, unjust. I think Korea presents itself as this model nation that has developed very quickly over time and is now rich and, and should be emulated to some extent. I think one of your guests in the past talked about international development in Korea. And Korea certainly tries to promote this model of development overseas. But well, when I look at Korea, what I see is more things that should not be copied than things that should be. And, and a lot of these are the kind of social issues that we discuss on Korea Expose, like the complete lack of a uh, social safety net for the elderly, the, the impunity with which uh, companies fire employees, very little protection in the job market, and also this uh, incredible sense of repression. Koreans I meet, uh, they don't feel free to talk, they don't feel free to do the things they would like, and they um, kind of follow this uh, transcript almost. You know, there are things that they're supposed to do and they're supposed to abide by them. If you deviate from that uh, established path, then there are penalties to pay. And I guess some people are happy doing that, but there are others who are not. And I feel like they're almost, uh, they seem to be almost punished. And that actually makes me kind of angry because I like to see a Korea that's diverse, uh, that's accepting, accommodating, uh, welcoming, um, not only of different views from different Koreans, but also from foreigners, especially foreigners who are not traditionally considered desirable here. But nonetheless, we're starting to see very large numbers of like migrant workers, foreign brides, people with darker skin. If we continue to abide by the same course of action that Korea has followed for the last decades, then we're going to see a great deal of tension and perhaps a uh, um, more uh, measurable future. So you believe more radical action is needed and it's not a work in progress? I do think radical action is needed, but to get there, we need to have some kind of awakening, uh, realization that there is something wrong. And in fact, there are a lot of people in Korea, I think, who truly believe there's nothing wrong here. That's what's really surprised me in a way. And that's also what's made me very angry, especially let's say, uh, my family. Hmm. They are well-off, and I know a lot of well-off people in Korea, and they absolutely think Korea is fantastic. I think Korea is a fantastic country for them, but Korea is not a fantastic country for people not like them. And I want to see more being said and done for those people. So do you feel strong opposition in South Korea or criticism of what you're doing from all these people who have not awakened yet to understand you. Is there is there a feeling you know that what you're doing is mm. maybe anti-Korean or? I personally have not been accused of being anti-Korean yet, but a lot of people that I do talk about and befriend uh, have been accused of um, engaging in activities that are not necessarily pro-Korea. I fully admit that, and and these are not some like crazy. North Korean spies, we're talking about NGOs that work on labor rights, that monitor uh, corporate behavior, people who work with uh, foreign brides, for example, even the poor. Somehow being poor or talking about poverty can seem anti-Korean to some people, which doesn't surprise me. But, but that itself is, a, I think, a real symptom of what's truly wrong in South Korea. But my own relatives certainly are not happy <laughs> with what I do. And, and they have routinely said to me, please say something nice about Korea. This is the dominant sentiment, not only of those uh, well-to-do people, but also I think the political establishment, the government. I think uh, a few days ago, I came across a, a, a tweet sent by um, James Pearson, who writes for Reuters, and, and it was about this speech given by Kim Mo-sung, the, the leader of the ruling Senuri party. And he actually said, please do not just report news about Korea. Please say good things about Korea. And everybody laughs, of course, because the job of a journalist is to report news, mm. right? not 
uh, spout propaganda. So that itself is an interesting illustration of how Koreans think um, people here should talk and also participate in this great promotion of South Korea. To play with the devil's advocate, isn't it something normal in a way? Because, you know, Korea had graduated from this backward country to a very modern country and they somehow, you know, want people to know it. They want to be proud, they want to be part of the club and then maybe in a few years, you know, they will transition to another phase where they accept criticism and self-criticism. I think it was a few years ago that a friend of mine who is, uh, specializes in Korean literature was interviewed by uh, a foreign newspaper about Gangnam style. This was the peak of size, uh, fame, and, and she was asked, uh, why does she think that Koreans are so enthusiastic about the fact that Gangnam style is popular abroad? It's not enough that it's popular in Korea. The fact that the world loves Gangnam style means something to South Koreans. And she gave a very long 30-minute interview but of course, uh, the, the reporter decided only to use the soundbite, which was um, Koreans suffer from deeply ingrained sense of inferiority, and they think any publicity is good publicity. Even today, I think this applies a few years later. And do I really believe people can get out of this without any kind of external shock? I am quite doubtful. And that's actually one of the reasons why I also write in English. I, why don't I write about Korea in Korean? Because Koreans don't listen to other Koreans. Koreans listen to the world. I by no means represent the world, but the fact that I write in this very dominant language means something to Koreans. And the fact that they may not like what I say about Korea in English is precisely what gives Korea Expose the kind of power and influence that it, it might have, if there's any to shape what happens here. A recurring topic in your writings is the Korean democratic culture, and uh, you wrote that Korea is arguably a repressive country. Why? Well, I only said arguably for rhetorical effect. <laughs> it is a repressive country. Well, I think one of the important things we need to touch on is the looming presence of the national security law, which has been used in interesting ways by the government to, to really silence anything that is critical of Korea. And it's really a law that is intended to stop pro-North Korean propaganda because, as we all know, the two Koreas that are at war and there are many people here who actually take the situation very seriously. However, this has somehow translated into sort of a tacit assumption that not only can you not say positive things about North Korea in any fashion, even if these things are very innocuous, like... Well, I love Taedonggang beer. Hmm? There is also, I think, an expectation, almost a requirement that you cannot say bad things about South Korea. For example, when I were to raise certain objections about the South Korean system, um, there are people who will say to me, then um, go to North Korea, go live in mm. North Korea. As if wanting changes within South Korea immediately translates into an endorsement of the opposite extreme. And it's always struck me how there can be no middle ground. And I think the NSO has unfortunately reinforced this. And, and on top of this, um, I think now we're starting to hear more about the, the defamation law, which mm. has been used with greater uh, enthusiasm by the current administration. Um, I think a good case that we need to talk about since it's ongoing is the, uh, the prosecution of the Japanese uh, reporter the Sankei Newspaper Bureau chief who has been sued for defamation because of certain things that he wrote about the president on the day of the Seoul ferry sinking. And it's not just that, but in other cases too, that we, we see how defamation has been used as a criminal offense to m simply stop people from talking. It's the chill factor. It's because most of the, these people actually win the cases in court, but of course... They were scared of doing anything. Right. It's else. incredible stress to yeah. be sued as a writer or a public intellectual or journalist. Um, the proceedings can drag on. You go in and out of court. Prosecutors are not allegedly nice. And it's harassment. I know some people who say defamation law is very important here because uh, there are so many rumors online. People will say a lot of things about other people that are simply not true. 
So I guess there are certain elements within the defamation law that do help to safeguard the need for people to be protected from malicious gossip, such as uh, whatever you say must be in public interest. That's one of the important factors. However, as you said, it's it's really the proceeding itself and the the fear of prosecution and possibly being sentenced. I think that stops a lot of people. There's so much great satire in Korea. Uh, Koreans are wicked with language. They're so good at it. Sometimes you read uh, comments on internet articles and, and like I can't help but think this is art. Right? But it's all anonymous. Um, and on top of that, the fact that there are people within the ruling party who actually want to pursue completely de-anonymizing the internet so that uh, whatever you say online must be done so with your real name. Mm. I suppose it's an interesting idea in theory, but we all know what effect this will have. Further crackdown on freedom of speech, further repression. And I think on top of this, it's really the fact that there's really no culture of speaking out in Korea. It's only recently with the internet that we're beginning to see people becoming more vocal. But generally speaking, Koreans will not say what they really think because they can be ostracized. Um, that can come from family um, at workplace. And if you are a student, then certainly, you know, teachers, classmates. I think uh, social pressure can be exerted in many different ways and through many different channels. And how do you move away from this culture of silence? It's going to take time. And I guess because I am an outsider, I feel that repression more acutely than people who perhaps live here all their lives and never really see that there may be something wrong with this. Why is that so? Because as a foreigner, you somehow see how things are, are different or and people here maybe don't realize it, that they're in this you know, system? Or why, why do you see it better than, than the Koreans who live in Korea? Well, it's the fishbowl effect, right? Mm. Uh, I don't mean the, the way people normally use it, but if you live inside, you know, it's water, right? What's there to be said about it? But if you're outside, uh, you see water and a lot of other things floating in it. And I think because I lived away from here for so long, it does give me distance. I'm not going to say it gives me more knowledge, but, but certainly I can see it from a different point of view. Talking about the free speech of foreigners uh, in, in Korea, um, what do you make of the case of Shin Eun-mi, this Korean-American who was um, accused of being uh, pro-North and was uh, expelled, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. what, is, what does that tell us that now even Americans... Uh... The Shin Eun-mi case really cannot be used to, to understand the, the whole situation in South Korea concerning what foreigners can and cannot say because her identity itself is ambiguous. Mm. You know, she is American, which is what I stressed in my writing. But when Koreans see her, they don't see an American, they see a Korean. And there, I think, um, the, the government certainly had more leeway because uh, she is a foreigner, but not quite completely foreign. I don't think it's a new law. It's a continuation of the existing law mm. because um, we have several cases where foreigners are expelled. And actually, um, um, there are foreign activists who are not allowed entry into Korea as well because they are suspected of planning to say things that may not necessarily sit well with the official agenda. However, what is interesting is that despite the fact that, as you say, Korea has grown to become this wonderful, shining beacon of hope in Asia, old habits have not died. Mm. Right? The law concerning um, the political activism by foreigners, I mean, the fact that it dates back to the 70s, but well, we still have it, is quite interesting. Of course, it's not a law that is widely used, but the fact that it is on the book, again, it's a chilling effect. If Korea really wants to send a signal that this is a vibrant, thriving democracy, why does it not take the steps to actually telegraph how seriously it is committed to upholding the principles of democracy that it allegedly champions, unlike North Korea? Propaganda is one thing, and then you look at the reality and it's quite another. Yeah, so the uh, Immigration Control Act regulates what foreigners can say and not say and do not do. Um, you wrote that it creates a climate of paranoia among foreign students. Mm -hmm. And so while we would 
like to kind of challenge you because you were being interviewed by a, a sure. student podcast uh, uh-huh. run by foreigners, at least until now. Um, is it really that dangerous, so to speak, to to exert your free sp- speech of the foreigner? Do you ever consciously do things that you feel are going against what the government wants you to say? I think the case of the student that I mentioned, Michael, mm. that was actually a very... Maybe you can explain what he was doing, what happened there. Sure. So so he's uh, someone I know personally. He used to be a student at Korea University doing graduate studies. I don't want to be more specific than that. And this was um, when the, the disclosures were made that the National Intelligence Service, which is the main spy agency in South Korea, had been... Uh, had interfered in the presidential election that led to the election of uh, Park Geun-hye as the current president of South Korea. They had sent out some two million tweets to discredit opposition figures and civic organizations and also really flatter the ruling party. And then there were other internet postings as well, which were equally political in nature. And the fact that we have uh, a government agency, on top of that a spy agency, covertly trying to manipulate public opinion is really, really disconcerting. So many people spoke out against what was revealed and they wanted a full investigation. And unfortunately, um, I think, frankly, what investigation that did take place really was a compromise. And the NIS continues to operate as usual. Michael, at the time, followed this uh, trend that was in vogue at the time on university campuses. Uh, Korean students were writing their honest opinions about this situation and posting them on around campuses. And so he participated even though he was a foreigner? He he participated, but what makes it doubly courageous is the fact that because he wrote it in English, it was so much more noticeable. I mean, there are a lot of Koreans writing it, so if you add one more Korean poster, People are not going to read it, but you see a foreign guy. As I said earlier, Koreans sometimes they care more about what foreigners think than what they themselves think. And Michael was aware of this, which is why he decided to do it because he felt what he was doing was right. It does not mean that he was acting in absence of fear. He he knew there would be consequences and especially since he had signed the form that said he wasn't going to do precisely this kind of stuff. You know, he had to make sure his identity was a secret. But what he did wonder to me, like, am I going to get expelled? And um, if there are other foreign students who do something similar, do they suffer from paranoia? I would like to think so, and I think they should. Hmm. Because the threat of consequences is, is real. I don't think it's something imaginary that I am hmm. touting just to uh, make readers see my point of view. But overall, if you are not active, then it's really not something you have to think about. But why is this repression so strong? I mean, there's nothing structural about one Michael writing something against the government. You know, what what is this weird relationship between, you know, the image of Korea and what foreigners can and cannot say? Um, Is it based on historical grounds somehow? Are you saying, um, why is it so important what foreigners say about Korea? Why, why is it so important to the government that one lone student at Korea University would say something negative? It's not that a lone student would say something about Korea. I think as a foreigner, if you do speak, you almost assume this um, kind of representative character. He may have spoken as an individual, but his voice was amplified to represent what foreigners in general think about Korea. And that can be dangerous mm-hmm. because... In a country that deeply cares about uh, outside opinion to the extent that the leader of the political, uh, leader of the ruling party will ask foreign correspondents to say nice things about Korea, I think that is significant. Once uh, someone wrote, uh, there may be more to be said about why Koreans care so much about foreigners. One is uh, the history of colonialism, the 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 various uh, attacks Korea has suffered from foreign powers and and how there is deep suspicion of the outside world. I think it's also the fact that Koreans um, have always deferred to the outside world in deciding what they are and what they should be. This is something I wanted to say before in my writing. The fact that Koreans have often 
define themselves in the pre-modern context for what the Chinese think things ought to be. It has been now replaced by what the so-called international community thinks Korea ought to be. And because of that, foreigners matter a lot here. People want to hear what foreigners have to say, and they like it when foreigners say nice things about Korea. But it also means they become very hostile when foreigners say things Koreans do not like. You also wrote about how foreign academics specializing in Korea, let's say, they face scrutiny from South Korean diplomats who try to interfere with their work. The question I really want to ask you is, are you talking about yourself? <laughs> and uh, do you have any examples no, you, can, no. you, can, you can provide us? I'm a small fish. Mm. They don't care about me. But it's more the fact that the institutions that have Korean studies are monitored. It's understandable in a way because we have to understand that the funding for Korean studies is limited. And there are two big sources. There is the Korea Foundation and there is the Academy of Korean Studies. They're both government bodies. So when you have a country that is actually actively funding studies about itself, naturally, you know, there may be some vested interest on the part of the funder to audit what is actually being said with the money mm. it's giving. However, the cases that I have come across are a little more alarming in that um, they will monitor the kind of academic programs that are on offer at Western institutions. They monitor the talks that are being given. And, and sometimes they will play interference to say they want to register displeasure. If you were to work on North Korean studies, things are a bit more complicated because then um, it's something considered politically sensitive. So, so you will be under greater scrutiny and, and part of it is um, to make sure, I guess, they want to avoid any possibility of espionage or any improper contacts between people who work on North Korea and North Korea itself. Um, and, and South Korean scholars who work on North Korea certainly would also uh, be asked to be transparent about, about how they do their research and how they gather their information. Um, so in your blog, um you also focus on those parts of Korean society that usually get little to no attention, and most probably because the country is not of those. What in Korea deserves more attention, according to you? The poor people, hmm. the elderly, migrant workers, women. But, of course, when I say women, particular aspects of being a woman in South Korea. And also um, corruption, I think, is a very important topic, as well as um, ajasi. That's always been something that's fascinating to me and, and I think really needs to be talked more about as a, as a particular form of culture, the way of thinking, the way of behaving. And certainly today I saw one article written by um, Jeffrey Kane, who writes for Global Post on the Ajumma spirit. And I thought that was like, this is a really kind of breaking point. Finally, we begin to see uh, something that really gets into the, the cultural aspect uh, What's the Ajuma spirit or the Ajushi culture? Young Koreans have started to use this word that is really very impolite. It's uh, Kejasi Kejuma. Have you heard of it? Mm. So Ke is dog, mm. right? Dog plus Ajushi. Mm. Dog plus Ajuma. So it's the fact that there's something so unpalatable about the older generation that the young people can no longer bring themselves to respect these people. Like the fact that, you know, I think what Jeffrey Kane said in his piece is uh, when he first came to Korea, he tried to be polite. He thought reason and etiquette would work to diffuse certain situations and help him, you know, survive. And then he realized, no, that actually doesn't work at all. And then he observed these ajumas in South Korea who just like act like they, they don't see anybody else. Uh, and somehow they get exactly what they want, right? So he started acting like an ajumma, and he's like, my life is so much easier. But do I really want to be like this? Right? Do I want to be this person that I myself don't like? And I think um, Ajusi culture too has received this criticism that somehow the argument goes that you know, Ajusis have stressful lives. Uh, they are the engine of South Korean economy. Uh, they have brought about this miracle 
they have wives and children to support. So we kind of need to cut them some slack, which is why it's okay for them to get wasted and vomit in the street, shout at people, spit, generally be rude, and sometimes very self-serving. And that's, um, that's I think, um, something that I think young people no longer wish to tolerate or certainly identify with. So you focus on Korea as a country of fault lines and divisions. We just saw one fault line here, the mm -hmm. young against the, the old, but there's also the rich against the poor, the conservatives against the liberal. Mm. Why do you believe these fault lines are so important in understanding Korean society? Because deep down, I think Korea runs on factionalism. Uh, what has been interesting to me, um, partly on Ilbe, but mm. also in talking to people in general, is this entrenched sense of regionalism. Like, oh, I'm from Seoul, but he's from Jibang, right? Countryside. Uh, he's from Jeollado, the southwestern province, but I am not. As if somehow this, you know, means something. And, and then you have um, other fault lines too, along your education. Like, I went to Sky. And then there are the people who went to the second tier schools. Or I come from Gangnam, and there are the others. So this constant yeah, exercise in, in, in self-identification that takes place really through uh, exclusion. I am not from there. I am not one of those people. I didn't go to that school. I think that's really one of the driving forces behind a lot of problems in Korea, which is why it needs to be understood better. But these fault lines, uh, they are in, in all countries. All countries have these, you know, divisions. Why is it so, so that in Korea it would be more extreme or more prevalent? I think these uh, fault lines, as you say, do exist everywhere. However, what I find striking in Korea is that these fault lines, they don't necessarily serve merely to exclude, but also to reinforce one's own position in society. Connections. What is your inmate really based on? Your region? your school, right, your neighborhood, your level of wealth. And these things become more important in countries where I feel public institutions do not function very well. Certainly, I mean, you go to France and there is the big Parisian versus the, the rest divide. And it's like Germans versus Greeks. And uh, um, However, do these divides really have a major impact on politics, on society? To some extent, yes, I think everywhere, but in Korea much more so. I think the fact that a lot of people don't think um, the, the rule of law doesn't work, the government cannot be counted on to enforce justice, you cannot just apply for a job and be considered based on merit. That's actually one of the campaigns now in Korea. Right? You can take a test that proves how employable you are, which is somehow supposed to um, help companies overlook any, anything else about you these fault lines exist because uh, that's how people can get ahead. Perhaps these are the only things I can count on to uh, stick together with the people who share the same backgrounds. So one group is at the heart of these fault lines. Uh, you wrote about them, uh, some young Korean men. Mm. And you wrote in particular about an infamous website called Ilbe. Could you maybe explain what Ilbe is about? I think you already mentioned uh, it actually. It is a website that is very well known in South Korea. We don't really know the, the makeup of Ilbe because it's anonymous. But it appears to have a sizable following, sizable number of users. And these people get together on this particular site to say very distasteful things about other people, especially the what I would call marginalized populations. So my perennially favorite subjects are migrant workers, right? mm. foreigners, women, poor people, people from the Jeolla province, right? These are the main targets. And and I think the reason Ilbe has really become so infamous in Korea is because the kind of language they use is so appalling. Why are these young men reacting like this? Why do they feel under threat and they have to go against these minorities? Well, I think more than anything, the young men in South Korea are perhaps the ones who feel the most vulnerable. Right. We're, we're looking at a very unstable job market, economic climate, uh, unemployment rate is going up. There is no permanent employment anymore. A lot of people get uh, laid off in their 40s and 50s, even from companies that were once considered 
safe places to sacrifice one's uh, life at. And on top of that, the cost of living has become so high. What our parents' generation used to do to buy us, uh, start as a renter, buy small apartments, move up, uh, get a bigger place. I think that's impossible now. Marriage is an expensive venture, uh, having children more so. And they feel that um, you can no longer enjoy the kind of privileges that were once accorded on being a South Korean citizen. And especially for men who used to be in position of privilege and power. I think that loss is felt uh, quite acutely. And they begin to resent the people that they feel are infringing on those uh, traditional rights, such as the migrants who seem to come and take over jobs, or women who seem to be demanding greater share of rights than before, equality, God forbid, and people who used to be uh, even more marginalized than before, like the people from Chala province, which traditionally has not seen as much economic development as certain other parts of the country. And, and then suddenly we had uh, these people taking up prominent positions in the government. And, and that breeds resentment and I think also a lot of fear. I want to quote from your blog. Um, Angry young men want vengeance but will not go after the rich and powerful. They do not have the courage. Instead, they are attacking the weakest, the most marginal, the most vulnerable. Why is that so? Why is in their wake-up call and go after, you know, the system? Why is it always a disenfranchised people going against other disenfranchised people? Because activism is a harder path. One thing I have come to accept in Korea is that I talked about how there's really no culture of free speech. I think another culture that's lacking is that of activism. The Korean word for activist is 활동가. If you introduce yourself as a 활동가 in Korea, you will be viewed with a lot of suspicion. First, it means that you are not really part of the traditional job market. What is this thing? Right? Mm. Especially in a country where having a title counts for so much. 활동가 is a strange title to have because it, it denotes uh, no social hierarchy. And on top of that, what activity are you doing? But then Korea has a strong history of demonstrations against the government during the authoritarian regime. So shouldn't it be a badge of honor to be a, a somebody who has, you know, this kind of, mm -hmm. this, these kind of values? Well, we have political activists, but have we really had a sizable number of social activists? The ones who call for specific reforms in, in particular sectors, categories like labor, immigration rights, women's rights. I think this is very new here. And also, it's, uh, it's not a comfortable path. Um, I think instead, what we're seeing is uh, two things. One is we have people who are deeply angry, and they decide that the only way to move up here is to be as atrocious as the people in power. In fact, um, one of the things that I highlighted in my piece is the fact that this may be on the verge of becoming mainstream, the, the angry young men. They actually serve a purpose, I think, in the eyes of the, the political right. And I think that alliance suggests how you can start being angry and you can transition to power. That's one way to feel empowered in a society that takes away what you think is yours. Another thing we're seeing is uh, people who are dropping out, people who are becoming so disillusioned with Korea that even as Koreans, they want nothing to do with Korea. Right now, the biggest news is the, the, the confirmation of the prime minister nominee. And every time we have this uh, nomination, a lot of dirty laundry comes out, of course. Permit me to qualify and say these are allegations. But every nominee is uh, trailed by so many allegations that one cannot help but start thinking. No smoke without fire. <laughs> You don't want to be sued for that. <laughs> right. but, but I think in many cases, the allegations are actually proven. And, and more than that, I think the larger message this sends is how is Korea so lacking in clean politicians that the only people we can get for political nomination are people who have to fight off allegations. And I think uh, just last month, there was a survey 
showing uh, the, the level of trust that the Korean university students have in, in the National Assembly and politicians. And I think the numbers were somewhere, it's less than 5%. So this is um, fewer South Korean university students than the ones who uh, trust uh, complete strangers and foreigners. Right? That's the kind of confidence that politicians enjoy in this country. And if they're not going to join that establishment, uh, they're going to turn their backs on it. And, and what does it really do for the national collective? Talking about the elite in uh, South Korea, you wrote an, art an article entitled Welcome to a Feudal Aristocracy in the Orient, oh, sorry, of the Orient, uh, in which you seem to say that the particular ending of the Korean Air story, uh, the Korean Air incident, the villain being thrown to jail, uh, Heather Cho, is rather the exception than the norm, and it gives the general sense that there is a caste up there. What do you make of that? Does it explain, you know, these fault lines in Korean society that, you know, there is the have and the have nots? And Just look at how much anger there was when this uh, story came to light. And um, it's not to say that Heather Cho is um, uh, an innocent victim here. She's clearly a nasty, nasty woman who abused a lot of uh, a lot of power that she had in the company as a result of her position as a daughter of the owner. But I think at the same time there was glee. Uh, some people were so happy to go after her. Finally, we caught someone in a position of power exposed and vulnerable. And I don't think in Korea you really see many instances of this. But didn't she take the t uh, sorry? Didn't she take the hit for the team? Because you wrote that it was quenching public thirst for fairness, mm. but it didn't bring about a national conversation about you know Korea's economic elite. It's, it's... Well, she certainly didn't take one for the team because her team of course. during the trial, you know, she said she's innocent. Right? She didn't do anything wrong, and uh, it's more that she's a sacrificial lamb. I wonder if there are other people in the Chebol establishment who are actually uh, potentially happy to see what happened to Troyana because it actually quenched the anger for a little while. It let out some steam. As to whether this actually brought out of a conversation, I absolutely agree with you that it did not. It's really in the foreign media that they think, oh, this is suddenly the moment in South Korea to really have that conversation about hereditary privileges and the concentration of wealth and the 1%, but nothing's happening here. Do you uh, think she got jail time specifically because the world was watching and so they couldn't let her go again, you know, image of Korea? Absolutely. I mean, it's a speedy trial. And I think the, the judge said it very clearly, you know, she damaged the national image. It's not about whether she's uh, she did something criminal. <laughs> she damaged the national image, which is not a criminal offense last time I checked. But the fact that this is actually being cited in the ruling speaks volumes about how the I think the elite knew they had to react in a very particular way. And also, this trial itself was very speedy. They wanted a resolution very quickly. And of course, uh, I, I cannot be 100% certain about this, but I imagine she'll appeal. Some Senuri uh, lawmakers want to release convicted Chebol CEOs because they would help Korea overcome the economic crisis. Isn't that sending the message that really there are two classes of citizens in, in Korea? Of course. Um, you know, there are differentiated rules somehow. Right. So, so they need a rationale. And the rationale has always been the economy. With the current president, the, the mantra is uh, deregulation. We need creative economy. That means deregulation. We need stimulation. That means deregulation. And why do we need deregulation? Well, because the Korean economy apparently is not doing well. Right? We need to go to the next level. This is another reason why I'm not very optimistic about the future. Because Korea right now is ranked where in the size of the national economy? 11th? 12th? But yeah, basically okay. in the, in the, there's the top 20 for sure, G20. Right, there's the size yeah. of the trade, mm -hmm. and there's also the size of the national economy. So one could say Korea has already done quite well. It's time to think about other matters, right? more pressing issues, like inequality, like the concentration of power in the elite, the fact that there are two sets of laws, one for the rich and one for the not. But instead... The argument is, no, we have to go to, I don't know, number seven, number five, number three. 
And what that means is, until Korea becomes number one, we can have no national conversation about any kind of reform. That's the logic being used by the political elite. I think this is a never-ending game. And frankly, the economy is really an excuse to suppress dissent. And I think it's worked in the past very well. South Korea developed in a way. It's a poor country. We need to have an industry. We need to manufacture. We cannot have labor rights because it disrupts manufacturing. And there was a huge crackdown on labor, which still continues to this day. The laboring class is in deplorable state in South Korea. Despite the fact that there are labor regulations, it's, um, they're not enforced well. I don't see any will on the part of the government to change this. How do you explain that the government wants to protect, or at least should I say some lawmakers want to protect these Chepul families, where at the same time in Korea there is a very strong culture of meritocracy, you know, all these standardized tests and this idea that if you really study hard you'll make it. Is South Korea truly a meritocracy? I don't think it's ever been a meritocracy. Yes, on paper, I think there are ways you can study, go to the, school, the right schools, apply for the right jobs, be considered, and move up. But so much of this uh, depends on factors that are not necessarily measured or noted on paper. And this goes back to the issue of factionalism that I mentioned earlier. Yes, you can apply for a job, but are you really being considered for your abilities? Or are there other circumstances that have really nothing to do with whether you're suitable for the school or job? And these are things that I think uh, really need to be exposed and dealt with now. One of the laws that are actually being considered in the National Assembly right now is called the Kim Yong nan law, which actually clearly defines what impropriety is and uh, conflict of interest on the part of public officials. Because for so long, it has been accepted as a norm that you can go and have dinner and drink and maybe other things with people who want something from you. It's chong. Uh, you form human connections, you cultivate relations. It's nothing, there's nothing wrong with favoring people you know over people you don't. Of course, you don't see this on paper, but this goes on in every sector. So much so that when I apply for jobs in Korea, the first thing my parents say to me is, are you sure you don't have to go over and say hi in person? That's euphemism for showing my face and trying to ingratiate myself with the people in charge because they don't trust the process. It requires that something extra. Even if it doesn't go into the realm of, uh, you know, bribery. There are ways this system really punishes people who are not already part of the elite circle. And, uh, and why? Why does the ruling party not care about all the angry masses out there who are <laughs> profoundly, profoundly unhappy with the fact that the power and money seem to be monopolized by a few? Well, I mean, based on the fact that Korea is a very connected society, they have their own connections and their own interests to maintain. They don't want to jeopardize that. So we have these companies that are controlled by families and oftentimes in manners that are dubious because of the very complex uh, system in place that allows them to maintain their control over, over the board without necessarily becoming majority shareholders. And also, it's the assumption that somehow, because they're born into the families that founded the companies, they, continue, they can continue to, to rule them like little kingdoms. Do we really see this example in other countries? I think there are a few, but overall, this is not how things are supposed to work. And I think for a long time, people have been willing to live with the reality that these families are controlling such large firms and by extension, the national economy, because there was always a threat. Um, if you disrupt the system, if you start to rock the boat, uh, the economy is going to suffer. Uh, that's the argument that's been made about the Samsung succession too. It's in a precarious position. It's uh, losing its shares of the, the luxury phone market to Apple. Uh, Xiaomi is taking over the, the lower tier. Uh, they need our support because Samsung is a Korean company. And I think this narrative, um, it also obscures the fact that the Korean multinational firms, 
as the word multinational suggests, um, are they really as Korean as they used to be? I mean, like a friend of mine went to Samsung headquarters in Suwon and said there are all these Indian shops in front of the company because there's so many Indian engineers working there. I don't think Koreans no longer believe that it is important to to live by uh, the status quo, and and I think they begin to see that this is unusual. Um, this is not normal. Dr. Ku, I think this brings us to a great conclusion to this conversation. Is your project Korea Expose based on the belief that journalism, commercial professional journalism has failed and you need to somehow build something that could be called citizen journalism or maybe volunteer work? What's, what's the solution to this problem? I think uh, traditional journalism still has a role to play. One is um, they can produce at a speed that people like us can never match because they still have some money, they have people, and, and we publish um, selectively, occasionally even, because um, that's the, the, the extent of what we can manage for the time being. However, what we can do is to cover stories that others who are more established are uh, covering, and, and I think that's where uh, Korea Expose will continue to find uh, readership. Dr. Ku, thank you so much for being our guest today, and uh, good luck with Korea Expose. Thank you very much for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.